Donald Talks and the Craft Innovation. Thank you. Thanks to all the organizers for putting together such an exciting workshop and overall such an exciting program this semester. It's really fun to learn about all the advances that are happening so quickly. So um, let me start with something uh, beautiful already. This is a zonotop, and the little movie that you see is courtesy of Noam Shomron, um, a friend of mine who is insanely good with computers, unlike myself. And so he put it all together. This is a zonotop, as a matter of fact. Um, it's more symmetric in reality than you see here. Here, one direction is artificially elongated. Um, but this is actually a zonotop based um, on the root system of one of uh, the best known Lie algebras, namely A3. And I am afraid I will not go into that direction. And I will just hint at various connections that representation theory has with what we call zonotopal algebra. Here, I actually will emphasize connections with lots of other things that I think will interest you a little bit more than connections with representation theory. But it's an amazing subject, which emerged on the border line um, of algebra, combinatorics, analysis, and I am just happy to tell you what I know about it. I will go fairly um, in depth, even though I'll you know, mostly talk about simple examples. And please interrupt me if you feel you need to understand something better. And I'm also happy to take any questions after my talk. So I want it to be as accessible as possible so that ideally someone in this room who has not seen this before might be inspired to actually use the construction set that I will describe here and maybe get something new out of them. All right, so let me start with just a bit of motivation that I'm very well familiar with. Probably not everyone in this audience even knows what splines are. Some people definitely do. Um, so here, is a, here is the father of splines, Isa Schoenberg, um, who, not surprisingly, also had to do a lot with the total positivity, uh, with some combinatorial results, with some really exciting characterizations of measures you know, that lead to real rootedness and with the lager poya class. So Schoenberg actually um, knew a lot of stuff that you know, we, we are discussing as the classical stuff in, in our subject. And among other things, Schoenberg is responsible for the creation of splines. Uh, and here is a spline curve, which is just drawn in 2D. Splines are just piecewise polynomial functions. And Schoenberg began developing this theory. If you've not heard of this, you might be interested to know that uh, splines are actually sort of the workhorse of numerical computation, or they have been until recently. I'm sure they're still in great use. I know Boeing still uses them on, on the everyday basis. And um, Carl de Boer, who was one of my sort of informal mentors at, in Wisconsin, actually was awarded the National Medal of Science primarily for his work on splines. He has done many other things, but in particular, he developed the theory of so-called B-splines. And these are just special bases of univariate splines, but they turn out to be incredibly useful and they turn out to be numerically stable, so that leads to um, a whole host of computational advantages and numerical methods that were developed as a result. So why am I telling you this? If you're interested in movies, as some of you are, uh, or any kind of computer-aided geometric design, morphing, and so forth, splines are actually used there. Again, I cannot speak uh, of exactly what algorithms were used. You might recognize this, this uh, screenshot. Well, this is the rendered image, and then this is the original acquisition. Um, this is what happened on this set of avatar, as you can guess. And you can see um, Zoe Zaldana's um, face actually kind of covered with points. These are not exactly control points that you see in uh, constructing spline uh, surfaces, but they're very close the, to, to these control points, and they're being used to actually morph the image of her face and then add extra texture and add all this additional um, enhancements that you know her image then undergoes. 
So it's quite surprising that uh, I think some people uh, might not know how useful splines are, but just in case you wonder, there is a lot of literature out there, and so if you're curious, you can, you can look it up. All right, so what does it have to do with zonotopes, and what does it have to do with combinatorics, statistical mechanics, partition functions, and all that stuff? Well, um, here is the multivariate generalization that the Bohr, Herlich, Riemann, Schneider, Damian, Michelli, and many other people uh, created. Um, this was about 1980s. Some of the work preceded 1980s. Some of the work was done past that time. And so if you look at the definition, this is one of the several equivalent definitions of box splines. You will see that they uh, are based on a matrix of directions. So I will call it capital X. By the way, some of this notation is a little bit unconventional. Um, you can read lots of different papers by now about what we call zonotopal algebra. And then if you're more of a combinatorist or more commutative algebraist, you will see s different variants of notation. Here I will just use this capital X, um, and this will denote a multiset or a matrix. And for simplicity, we'll just take it to be full rank. I'll speak more about what to do if it's not full rank. So think about just a bunch of columns. So given this bunch of columns, you can actually associate it to a offhand a distribution, which actually is a function, which actually is a compactly supported piecewise polynomial function given through its Fourier uh, transform in the following fashion. So you see the directional vector x that comes, so that's a particular column vectors, vector in your matrix, you go over all possible column vectors in your matrix. You don't have to think of them as column vectors, your choice, but let's stick with that convention. And so you create a exponential with a frequency, so to speak, which is determined by your vector x. And then you create a bunch of uh, the so-called sync functions. These are actually just this. You might have seen them before. These are the so-called sync functions. You're multiplying all of them on the Fourier domain. Okay. So multiplication on the Fourier domain becomes convolution on the space domain, and that's exactly what you will see. So this is the distributional definition of your box spline. It's, it's given to you through its action on test functions, and this is exactly what it does. And hence the name box spline. It will take the box, the unit box, which is just the 0, 1 to the power equal to the cardinality of x, meaning the number of its columns. Okay, So take, it will take this box, and you will transform your argument, which is also a vector, using your matrix slash linear transformation, x, and you will subject it to the test function phi, and then you integrate. So this is the distributional definition of your um, box spline. It is piecewise polynomial, compactly supported. And it has certain smoothness, which is dictated by basically how many times you convolve. It's a little more complicated than that, but you can also determine its smoothness. All right, so now what about zonotopes? Zonotopes naturally arise here because zonotopes are actually exactly the supports of box splines. Okay? So the zonotope that is determined by your matrix X is nothing but the image of this unit box under the linear transformation x. And this is nothing else but the Minkowski sum of segments, segments being determined by the columns of your matrix, right? So this is exactly what you're going to get if you look at the support of the corresponding box plot. So here's a picture in 2D. This is a particularly simple zonotop, nothing fancy going on. This is not a three-dimensional picture just shown on the plane. It's really, truly a two-dimensional picture. And I took just these three vectors in R2, and I built the corresponding zonotop. So it's a sort of one of the baby, baby examples you can try just to test how things work. OK. As I had mentioned al already, surprisingly, that very modest object, which is nothing but the Minkowski sum of segments, um, begins to emerge and begins to connect with many different fields of mathematics. And so I'll tell you a little bit today, and as I said, feel free to ask me more questions and feel free to you know, read beyond what I will tell you today. 
So it turns out it, it is connected with representation theory. It is connect, connected with toric algebra. We can do various things with zonotops, like their tilings. We can count integer points in zonotops efficiently. And we can uh, connect all this machinery with graph theory and uh, various other things. I'll not pursue connections with tropical geometry, but they exist as well. And there are connections with various various models of probability and statistical mechanics. And this I will speak about a little bit today. All right, so to explain how this machinery works, let me just uh, continue with this basic example. I will slightly modify the basic example to show you that it could be a multi-set. So you see a repetition of the first column vector, nothing fancy going on, just this one repeated. It's perfectly allowed because you are allowed to take multi-sets. And you can start counting. So in particular, you can count the number of bases in arising out of this configuration slash matrix X. You can count the number of independent sets. Um, we're counting your, you, you already see these are matroidal notions beginning to emerge. And so we can count the number of independent sets. The notion of the basis is the usual notion, just the linear algebraic notion of a basis. And here the notion of an in, in independent set likewise is the usual linear algebraic notion. Now, here come um, somewhat interesting objects. These are called internal bases. And um, for the, those of us who were here on Tuesday, I believe, uh, the notion of non-broken uh, non circuits was introduced. So I'll come back to the, and I'll show you how this notion is related to the notion that we, we heard about on Tuesday. Right now, let me just give you a definition of internal bases. Internal bases are actually bases with zero internal activity. It's a little counterintuitive, but unfortunately that's the terminology and I will just stick with that. If you don't like it, you can use a different one, different notion. Um, but basically what happens here is that you take a basis and you test it for the following property. You look at each column in your basis and you test whether this column is actually the last element which is in X take away H where H is the hyperplane which is spanned by the, by the other vectors in your basis the other vectors in your basis, okay? And if this does not happen to be the case ever for your basis, you declare it an internal basis. So these are special um, bases, and offhand it's not clear why they should be special, what role they are gonna play, but we will see later that they actually count something interesting. All right. <coughs> So here comes a little bit of analysis or commutative algebra, if you will. It's fairly basic, but it's very interesting what you can do. So you can consider the hyperplane arrangements that are determined by your column vectors, the column vectors in your configuration slash matrix. And in fact, you can shift. So this is the linear form, which is determined by your column vector x, right? And you can shift it by pretty much anything by an arbitrary constant, which I'll call lambda x. There will be some minor conditions on lambda x. You want to avoid some sort of degeneracy. But other than that, you're very free in, in this choice. So basically, if you make a random choice, you will be fine, OK? And so you can consider then the corresponding arrangement of hyperplanes that will be determined by your vector of um, direction uh, x, well, the whole collection of those vectors x, and this lambda sub x's that you've chosen. And um, so far nothing has happened, but then you can start counting. And when you start counting, you will observe some pretty striking facts. So here is three things you can count. You can count um, vertices of your hyperplane arrangement, you can count chambers or connected components of your hyperplane arrangement, and you can count um, the number of bounded connected components of your hyperplane arrangement. And so if you were to carry this whole thing out for the baby example that we started from, 
you will see some numbers emerging. So in this particular case, you will see numbers 5, 10, and 2. And if you go back a little bit, you might observe we didn't do this exercise, but we can start counting bases, independent sets, and internal bases. And lo and behold, we will see exactly the same numbers. You will see 5, 10, and 2 occurring here. So just so you, if you want to check, here are all the independent sets, and here are all the bases, right? and here are all the internal bases. I should note that the notion of an internal basis as given depended on the order, namely how you ordered those columns in the matrix. But as a matter of fact, the number you're going to get will not depend on the order. So again, something should sound very familiar here. So here I just tried two different orders just for fun. So you'll see different outcomes of the counting. Well, in terms of the actual basis, internal basis per se. But you will see that the cardinality of the corresponding collection will not change. So this is not a coincidence. And in fact, there were no coincidences here. So these are all these true facts. Here is another baby example. So I apologize that this is all in 2D. It's a little bit harder to count things, you know, to show how to they, they get counted in 3D or 4D. It's a little bit harder. Can you again define this BCC? What does it again? Uh, the number of bounded connected components. Yeah, what, That's, what, what is the geometric definition again? Well, you have the hyperplane arrangement. Your hyperplane arrangement splits the space, in this particular case, the plane into components, uh -huh. right? Connected components. And some of them will be unbounded, uh -huh. and some of them will be bounded. So if you only count the number of bounded connected components, this number magically is equal to the number of internal bases. And the total number of vertices is magically equal to the number of bases. And the total number of connected components is equal to the number of independent sets. So none of this is a coincidence. These are all facts. OK, so how does this actually work? And what's, what's the story here? Here is um, what um, De Boer and his co-authors first proposed. He, uh, so they looked, Diamond and Michelli were also two people who were responsible for, for uh, the early development of this theory. So I should not forget those two names. In fact, the spaces are sometimes called Diamond Michelli spaces. You may see that in the literature. So what happens here? You take those vectors that determine your matrix, that your matrix consists of, and then you look at the corresponding linear polynomial. Here you can drop the, the the funny lambda sub x, you might use that too. It will be sort of the inhomogeneous version of your construction. It does not matter. OK, but let's, let's drop this for now. And then you can put them together. This will be just products of linear forms. So this will be a homogeneous polynomial determined by a subcollection from your multi-set slash matrix that you can pick. OK, so, so far, nothing, nothing fancy is going on. You can also consider it as a differential operator. So this is going to be a homogeneous differential operator of degree equal to the number of columns that you picked. And again, repetitions are allowed. You can do whatever you want. Linear dependencies are allowed. That's perfectly OK. So if you do all that, then you can decompose the whole Boolean algebra of subsets of x into so-called long and short subsets. So what is long and, and what is short? You call a subset long if what happens is it meets every basis in your collection of bases. Again, you, those of you who work with matroids, you may recognize this as a familiar notion from matroid theory. And what is short? Short is the opposite of long. If this does not happen, that means if you avoid a basis, at least one, then you will, the, the corresponding subset will be called short. So in other words, Short means that the complement is what? What rank? Full rank. Full rank, exactly. So short means the complement of your subset is full rank, exactly. OK, here is just a, continuing with our baby example. Here is the full splitting into long and short. And you can notice that the collection of long subsets is closed under taking supersets, as it should. And the collection of short subsets is closed under taking subsets, as it should. So no surprises here again. OK. 
So this is long and this is short. And here comes the early result that was proven by Domin and Michelli, historically the first result, which connected splines with all this business that I just introduced. So it turns out that if you consider the set of all polynomials that are annihilated by these differential operators, remember, that came from the long subsets. This is precisely what's called the local box spline space, or the local the space spanned by pieces of the box spline. So if you look at this, this is the so-called space D. So people in approximation theory slash analysis were interested in determining the dimension of this space because it precisely determines the approximation power of box splines. And it turns out that the dimension of that space is exactly equal to the number of bases in your configuration x, which is quite striking. Well, I can actually show you more. There is another space, namely the one just given by spanning, taking the span of all short homogeneous polynomials. Remember, the q sub y is the polynomial, which is just a product of linear forms. Uh, coming from this subcollection y. And so if you take all the short subsets and then you take their span, which is going to give you another finite dimensional linear subspace, oh, space, then you will get another space p, and its dimension is also equal to the number of bases. And moreover, there is a natural duality between p and d, which is playing a role here. These are not ident d is not p, generally. Sometimes they can accidentally be the same. But generally, these are two different spaces. But there is a magic duality between them, which I'm kind of sweeping under the rug here. But uh, we, can, we can talk about this after the talk if you want. So this second statement is due to two teams, um, Akopian and Sayakan, and Din and Ron. And this was done in 1989 and 1990. And that started sort of this whole, this whole uh, area, and it, be, it, it pushed people towards the understanding, which is still, you know, developing, uh, of how combinatorics fits into this and how commutative algebra precisely fits into this. So Amos Ron and I have a long paper, which is called Untouchable Algebra, where we summarize pretty much everything that was known up until that point, and we um, we push the, uh, those results as far as we could at the time. Now we could do more. But at the time, um, the, uh, the paper came out in 2011. Um, that was pretty much what was known at the time. Okay. So hyperplanes. Remember, we dealt with hyperplanes as well. We also have duality going on on the hyperplane arrangement side. Namely, we have the primary hyperplane arrangement and the the other hyperplane arrangement. We first called it the dual hyperplane arrangement, but this term was taken for something else. So we actually switched to calling them the facet hyperplanes. So what are the facet hyperplanes? If you take hyperplanes that are just spanned by some vectors in your configuration x, um, then you will also get sort of a hyperplane arrangement. So here, what you see is I'm showing sort of double lines. This is the primary picture. This is the original hyperplane arrangement. And this is the dual slash facet picture. So you see another double line emerging here. And again, all of this is in 2D. This is very basic. All right. So there is an annihilating ideal for the second space P. It can be determined by taking your hyperplanes that are coming from your configuration of facet hyperplanes and taking the vector um, which is pretty much uniquely determined. Well, it, it is unique up to scaling, um, which is normal to H, and then taking what's called its multiplicity, namely the number of vectors in X outside the hyperplane H. And this will be the ideal that will determine um, the space P. By the way, so you see both spaces P and D are actually defined or pretty much defined as kernels of certain differential operators. And you can check that even if you drop the condition that you're looking for polynomials and look among all distributions, then it doesn't matter. You will only get polynomials in the kernel. So this is an interesting fact. And uh, you can just check it directly. 
OK, so I promised you a little bit of analysis. And here is, here is something that De Boer and his co-authors did, in fact, prior to this, to this results. They considered um, the basic question of interpolating in Rn. So we all know interpolation in 1D. Lagrange uh, did that. And you know, their variance, so sort of the limiting case of Lagrange is Hermit. So we know how to do that. It's an all nice and beautiful. Um, and in the multivariate case, things are far from being nice and beautiful, except here. So this is the most beautiful theory for the multivariate case. And it's, in a way, strikingly simple. And it's, I think, reminiscent of some of the techniques that you will see, um, in particular, in what we just heard about the other day, what uh, Petra Branden and June Hu were, were doing. Some of these techniques are quite reminiscent, at least to me, uh, of what's happening here. So uh, what happens here? You take a bunch of points. So you want to interpolate at those points in Rn. These are distinct points, by the way. I'm not looking at coalescences. This is a little more technical. So I'm looking at distinct points in Rn. It's a, it's a set. It's not a multi-set. No repetitions. And first, I can look at the span of exponentials with the exponents given by these points. Okay. So this is the exponential that you can construct. And then you're looking at the finite dimensional linear span of this exponential. So far, so good. Then, since we are talking about entire functions, everybody in this span is an entire function. In particular, has a formal power series expansion. Well, you can look at its far, power, power series expansion and single out the first non-trivial homogeneous chunk. Okay. So some of them will have no constant terms. Fine. Some of them may have no linear terms. Fine. Um, so you go and examine this from this from the beginning, and you come across the first non-trivial homogeneous piece, and you take this. And this is what this least operator will do. So it's not quite this multi-affine part operator, but it's a little bit in the same in a similar spirit. I think it works a little bit similarly. Okay. So you take this, and this is going to be the result of your operation f down arrow. OK. So look at all of them and take the span. This is now a polynomial, right? This is a homogeneous polynomial. So take the span of all such polynomials that you can obtain, and you will call this pi capital pi of sigma. So. Now, lo and behold, it turns out that there is a bijection between the set of your original points and this, um, and this span. Namely, well, by taking the restriction to the, to the original point sigma, you will create a well-defined interpolation problem that has exactly one solution. And this is going to be the solution related to the problems we've just seen. Namely, if we're looking for this hyperplane arrangements, and they happen to have the right number of vertices, I should notice that you, know, you can, there is a technical condition there that you should not make your um, hyperplanes coalesce, for example. But you know, more than that, the intersection should always have the right co-dimension co if you have k hyperplanes, then the co-dimension should be k. If this condition is met, then the number of vertices will be equal to the number of bases. And under these conditions, the least polynomial space that you're going to obtain is going to be exactly the space d that arises out, this, out of this De Boer, um, Ron, and et cetera constructions. So you can say all of this is old stuff. How is this relevant? First of all, here is a little bit of algebra that we can do. These are the main sort of algebraic points. You can, you can verify that the spaces are indeed going to give you full duality. And you can run a bunch of proofs, first of all, just related to the dimension of the spaces. And you can check that this 
chain of inequalities will hold, namely that the number of bases will not exceed the dimension of D, and the dimension of D will not exceed the dimension of P, and the dimension of D does not exceed the dimension of the kernel of the annihilating uh, ideal I, and then finally, it will be again bounded by the number of bases in X. This is a little bit technical. I'm not gonna talk about how you prove this. This is a fairly lengthy business but you can prove all of these things. And this establishes full duality that all these dimensions are in fact equal to the number of bases in X. Okay. So now we come to counting questions and you will see some interesting things going on. Remember our spaces were kernels of differential operators? So actually trivially, they will be invariant under any kind of differentiation operators you may want to use. Right. By being, remember, they are kernels of differential operators. So if you want to differentiate any of them, they will still stay within the kernel. And so right off the bat, trivially, you'll see that these are D invariant spaces, which is a huge advantage. So they are actually graded. That means they're spanned by homogeneous polynomials, and they are D invariant. And you can count dimension by dimension exactly what you know, the grading is. And here is an algorithm how you can count. So there is a so-called valuation function that will do that job for you. So the valuation function um, <coughs> looks at, um, first of all, the answers are the same for P as for D. And the reason is because this, um, because of the nature of duality, there is a bilinear form that takes arguments from P and D, and this bilinear form respects homogeneity. And because of that, all the homogeneous dimensions of P are the same as the homogeneous dimensions of D, which is again an advantage. You can count on that side or you can count on this side, whichever you prefer. So however you prefer to do this, there is a valuation function that will do it for you. So here is how you can use it. You will take and look at all all vectors x, and then you will see whether x is in the span of the basis vectors from a given basis b, okay, that are going to precede x, that precede x. It could be x itself, okay? And if this condition is met, then you count this in. So the valuation function will count all these vectors. And the answer to your question, what is the homogeneous dimension in degree j, is going to be given by the value of this valuation function. So however many bases there are that give you this value j is going to be the answer to your homogeneous dimension question. So just to give you an example again, here's what you get from our baby little matrix. Here it is. And here is all the homogeneous dimensions. So you will see, of course, at the constant level, you only have dimension one to work with, and you will see, you see it here, right? So this is, this is what corresponds to degree zero. This two will correspond to degree one. Again, no surprise here. You have what's called full saturation in degree one. Uh, you have both linear terms in degree one. And in degree two, you start losing saturation. So you will see two values equal to two and therefore, the homogeneous dimension in degree two is equal to two. Okay, so you'll see this whole grading going on zero uh, occurring once, one occurring twice, and two occurring two times. So your dimensions are one, two, two. Okay. So you have now a homogeneous basis for P, and then at the time we wrote the paper, we didn't have a homogeneous basis for D, but then later Matthias Lenz um, produce the homogeneous basis for D. So now you can also have a very nice homogeneous basis for D. And you see those dimensions emerging again as I, as I advertised, this numbers one, two, two will emerge. Okay. So it turns out all of this generalizes actually quite a bit. So first of all, you can generalize this to what's called external zonotopal spaces. And you have the collection of external bases. You have the collection of all the external spaces, P and D, full duality, the same count, the same valuation function works. It's, it's quite amazing. The same annihilating ideals. You have to just be 
uh, careful with the definitions and you have to be careful with the proofs. I mean, proofs are still required. But you, you can do all of that and uh, surprisingly, all of this goes through. So external just means so here's a construction that gives you external basis. You add any fixed basis towards at, at the end of your matrix slash multiset, and then you perform a greedy completion, well, the greedy completion of your independent sets to a basis, right? So you grab the first column that you can, if you can, then you examine the next one. If you can add it, you will add this, and this happens until you form a basis. So this greedy completion will give rise to what's called external basis of your original configuration. And from the construction directly, they're in one-one correspondence with independent sets. And then you see the whole machinery works out as, as it did before. And in particular, you see again the spaces P plus spanned by everything. Now it's really, truly everything, okay? And then you see space D, D plus and so forth. And you will see in this definition as the kernel that the multiplicities will have to be bumped up by one. So all of this goes through. And you have another interpolation pro uh, problem now. For the vertices corresponding to the external basis, and it gives you this new space D plus. So just to illustrate what the external basis look like, this was our original <coughs> configuration. And the green ones were vertices of the original hyperplane arrangement. And now we just added an extra two lines. And we got this red vertices in addition. OK. By the way, I went a little bit fast. But for someone uh, who paid attention, that I know this is a little bit harsh maybe to ask this question. So why am I not taking this guy? I got all these red extra vertices. So this new interpolation problem will involve the green vertices and the red vertices. But for some mysterious reason, I'm not taking this, the white one. So why not? Any guesses? How do I form the, the new extra basis? The external basis are formed by greedy completion of something, right? So the white vertex that will occur here here it is. Actually, does not come from a greedy completion. Everything else will, but this vertex does not correspond to a greedy completion to a basis. So it will not actually enter this interpolation problem. This is a little technical. Okay. So you can do all of this, and all the machinery works out. And now instead of going up, so this will enlarge your sets to all independent sets and so forth. Right? Instead of going up, you can also go down. And then you can do the interior version of all the constructions that you've seen before. So internal rather than interior, I should say internal analysis. So you can define the corresponding space p minus and d minus. And as you see, this will correspond to these multiplicities going down by one in the definition of P as the, as, as the kernel of differential operators. So you can go up, you can go down, all the things will work out. By the way, you cannot play this game forever. So you cannot go down beyond this level. If I start subtracting two, I will be in trouble. Uh, Federico Ardila and Alex Bosnik have explained why, why not. Um, so these are the limits of going down. You can go up further, but going down, is only possible to this level, at least uniformly. OK. So as a matter of fact, yeah, so everything works out. So all the numbers agree. The number of in internal bases will give you the dimension of your spaces, d minus, p minus. And the, the corresponding interpolation problem is, again, well defined and gives you this space, d minus. So everything is, is, is working just as beautifully as before. And the grading is there, the d invariance is there, everything as before. OK. So you can, as I mentioned already, you can generalize this even beyond the subtraction of one and the addition of one in those exponents. In fact, um, there is some work by um, Amos Ron and Ji Chiang Shu and myself, as well as Matthias Lenz, where we explore what else you can do. You can do a little bit more. 
or quite a bit more, as a matter of fact. And Matthias explained, Matthias Lenz explained why. So he has this whole notion of an upper set of a matroid that explains what you can and cannot do, what intrinsic um, uh, barriers there are. And there are generalizations by now also to toric arrangements by Luca Mochi. So if you're interested in toric algebra, you are welcome to see what he has to say. It's very interesting. He has a, a number of papers on the subject. OK, so now back to zonotops. If we are in the unimodular situation, <laughs> namely if our matrix is unimodular, does everyone know what unimodular means? Maybe not. What is unimodular? It's a situation where all the determinants you can form from your matrix will give you plus or minus one, exactly. This is the unimodular situation. And in particular, if you look at the, at the incidence matrix of a graph, this is a prominent instance where you do get unimodular matrix. Uh, unimodular matrix. Okay. So in that situation, there is more we can do, in particular the zonotop, which is again the image of the box 0, 1 to the power x under the linear transformation x, is particularly nice. And the polynomial interpolation problem that De Boer and Ron and others considered actually will give you the space P plus if you base this interpolation on the points um, that on, on all the integer points in the zonotop. So this would be including the boundary, okay? And if you only want to work with the interior integer points of the zonotop, you will get the space P minus. And of course, you should expect the space P to be in between P minus and P plus, as it should be. And in fact, you can do that too. So if you take your zonotop and shift it just by an infinitesimal amount, um, so you lose some points that were on the boundary, right? And you will keep some points. So if you shift that by an, an infinitesimal amount, then consider the corresponding interpolation problem, then it will give you the space P. So this interior, exterior, uh, and <coughs> sorry. points in, in the bulk of the zone on top, they can be all used all the integer points there can be used to solve and set, well, set up and solve very nice interpolation problems. Okay, so what does it have to do with graphs? We already saw that graphs gives a, give us unimodular matrices, and in fact, graphs have this beautiful encoding, probably you are mostly all familiar with this, um, where you just have to encode each vertex between, sorry, each edge between i and j as the difference between the unit vector ei and the unit vector ej. And you will see the matrix arising out of that, which will have just one little problem, namely it won't be full rank. You may just consider this for a second. Because of the definition we made, um, it will be rank deficient. So to correct this little deficiency, you can delete any one of its rows. And then you will be in the full rank situation. So that's the one little technical correction you might want to perform. So you can see, for example, here, this is a triangle with a double edge encoded in that fashion. So actually, there is an extra row that has been deleted here. And that extra row consisted of what? Negative 1, negative 1, 0, 0. Right. So that was the extra row that was deleted. So actually, it's a, it's a matrix that comes out of a graph on three vertices. One of the edges is doubled. This one is doubled. And what you see here is a full triangle you know, with this extra edge. And this is, in fact, the baby matrix we already considered. So you, you'll recognize it. It's the same. It's the same guy. So, what do you get out of this whole zonotopal stuff if you look at graphs? Then you start counting familiar things. Independent sets are what? For a graph. Forests. forests. These are spanning forests. Cool. And bases are? 
spanning trees. Spanning trees. And internal bases are non-broken -broken bases. bases, exactly. Yes. <laughs> so you start counting familiar objects. That's exactly right. And you see the Todd polynomial emerging in the context of this zonotopal spaces. Well, in fact, it's a little bit, uh, it's, it's the other way around, I should say. Uh, maybe it's a little disappointing. So you can transition from the Todd polynomial to the Hilbert series of your, ba uh, of your zonotopal spaces, but not directly back. Precisely the following will happen. So here is the definition um, of the bivariate Todd polynomial. Here is one form, here is an equivalent form. And you will see this external activity being counted and the internal activity being counted in you know, one of the definitions. This is often taken as the primary definition. Sometimes this is taken as the primary definition. The point is that there is an intimate connection between the Hilbert series of the zonotopal spaces I just talked about and the bivariate tut. Precisely, this is the specialization of the bivariate Todd polynomial that will give you the Hilbert series for the central case. Okay? And this is the specialization that will give you the Hilbert series for the plus case, for the external case. And this is the specialization will, which will give you the Hilbert series for the internal case. Yes? What's the Hilbert series? The Hilbert series um, is the function generated by the by the counting of these homogeneous dimensions. If you, have, if you have a graded polynomial space, then you will go from degree zero to your top degree, to the highest degree, right? And you count each dimension. So this is the slicing that we were already looking at, right? So, so you count this homogeneous dimension by homogeneous dimension, and you record this in a generating function. So this is your Hilbert series. And it turns out that the Hilbert series that you will obtain in all three cases has a lot to do with the Todd polynomial. And precisely these are the specializations that you can get. So Federico Ardila and Alex Hosnikov noticed that, and we also noticed that, which is quite, quite interesting. And just to, to mention a few things that have been just spectacularly improved, um, Mason's conjecture concerned the so-called independent set polynomial, which was another specialization of the bivariate tut. Here it is, okay? And the coefficients of that were conjectured to be, well, log concave and even ultra log concave, and all of this turned out to be true. So Matthias Lenz established the log concavity based on the characteristic polynomial results of um, who and cuts. And now, of course, we just learned that this sequence is also ultra-log concave, which is very exciting. Uh, there are lots of other connections with the chromatic flow and other graph polynomials. So some of this is explained in Matthias Lenz's work. But generally, and I will finish with that, there is uh, the multivariate Todd polynomial, of course, introduced by Sokol in his beautiful paper on the multivariate Todd polynomial. So here is the definition he starts with. There are several equivalent definitions you could use as well. And then you can specialize this further, namely um, to the bivariate case. And you can also connect this with various models of statistical mechanics. So the way it's stated with this definition, this is actually precisely the partition function of what's called the Q state POTS model. And if Q is equal to 2, this is the so-called easing model. Oh, by the way, Sokol makes a very funny observation that these are the names uh, given to models after the student, even though they were invented by their advisors. And he, he says, I hasten to add that this is rather an exception than the rule. So, so these are the two models that you will see. Um, and you can connect. There, there are specializations of the multivariate tut, oh, pardon me, multivariate tut that will also give you the chromatic polynomial and a whole bunch of other polynomials which are important in statistical mechanics as well. So please read the uh, paper by Sokol. It's a beautiful paper where he explains all these connections. Some of them need what's called a scaling limit 
procedure to actually get there, but it, it's very exciting. So in this connection, um, I will pose a couple of questions, but before I do that, let me mention some basic references in this area. So in chronological order of publication, here they are. There is a lot more out there by now. These are just some sort of basic uh, works in that area. And as I promised, here are some basic questions. So suppose you have uh, a finite dimensional space of multivariate polynomials, which happens to be de-invariant. Um, so it's graded, right? graded by total degree. And then you're composing its Hilbert series, the one we just described. right? So you just go dimension by dimension and measure this and then put it into a generating function. So the generating function is unimportant. It's the sequence which is important. The question is, under which conditions will you get log concavity or ultra log concavity? So maybe it's very general, but it's a very interesting question in my opinion. And another question you can ask, all right, what other partition functions of statistical mechanics give rise to ultra or simply log concave sequences? So now it seems like we can connect lots of things due to the work on Lorentzian polynomials to that property. And so maybe a lot of this generating functions of statistical mechanics are actually going to give us ultra log and cave sequences, which would be also very exciting. So I just want to leave you with three things that zonotops are surprisingly multifaceted, pun intended. And so all of this might be actually useful in what you do. So do take a look. The zone bubble constructions are not complicated. They are actually nice and friendly. And you can maybe get something out of them. I would love that to happen. And um, finally, there is, I'm sure, a lot more out there that can be explored. So thank you very much. In, in the first case, how do you mean the ultra low concavity of value per series? It, it, it is an infinite sequence of. No, these are all finite because we have all these spaces that are finite dimensional. So the Hilbert series will always terminate. Oh, I see. Yeah. So nothing here is infinite. Of course, you can go to larger and larger dimensions, but nothing in what I mentioned was infinite dimensional. Your question here, like, is it understood for which the invariant subspaces the Hilbert theory is, is real rooted as a polynomial? That is another good question. Um, so the question was, under which conditions is the Hilbert series real rooted? I have no idea. I, I've not seen, maybe Bernd knows something, but um, I have not seen any attempts to solve this problem. That's another good question, definitely. I should mention one more thing, if I may. So you notice that the leading coefficient of this Hilbert series coming from the minus space, from the internal space, p minus d minus, is exactly the guy you want to approximate. Okay? So this is all wishful thinking on my part. But it sounds like if you can get it through some specialization of a Lorentzian polynomial, right? then you can approximate it efficiently in polynomial time. Uh, but I don't want to say anything that would be wrong. Um, the bivariate Todd polynomial is not homogeneous. If it were, we would have been done. Uh, but it's not homogeneous. And so I don't know offhand how you can actually carry this out. The connection exists right, between the multivariate and bivariate. Um, but it's a little bit tricky, so I think it needs some work to actually see. Maybe it's possible, maybe it's easy to do now that we know that the multivariate tot is actually Lorentzian. So that would, could be very interesting. I mean, it's not, it's not log to k or Lorentzian for all q, right? It only works for, for q within 0 and 1. That's the problem. Right, but still there is a connection, so maybe you can somehow explore that. I'm not saying the corresponding. Um, polynomial will give you ultra-lock and cavity all the time? This is another good question. Exactly. So 
This is all open. All right. Thanks.